Hello everyone, today is Thursday, November 1st, 2018. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. We've been having a few glitches here and there, but I'm working my way through it as far as getting the information about the show out. So those of you who actually made it, I appreciate it. Those who have signed up previously, my apologies, and I'll get you the new links if you're watching recording of this. So what do we talk about? <laughs> Let the Church of Trend uh, begin. Yeah, I actually have some uh, Church of Trend following uh, slides in here. Church of what's happening now slides. So, so what do we talk about? Well, let's talk about current market conditions, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them on the slides just so my ADD doesn't kick in. And when we get to the live charts, feel free to ask about anything you want. We can always go back to the slides if we have to. And then when we get to the live charts, let's talk about your favorite stock picks if you don't mind and this is for your benefit ask about one stock at a time so this week's focus i woke up this morning thinking well i really need to continue my discussion on these potential bear market signals in the works and the other thing i got to thinking about is it's been a while since i talked about psychology and in working on this learning management system, I've come to realize that there are two types of traders, those who want to be successful and those who think that they want to be successful. That's going to make a lot more sense in just a few minutes. As you know, you can lose money trading if you've been trading for more than one day or as often sum it up, all predictions about the future and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. So, I think it was last April this market started to look a little iffy, and we're going to look back at last April in a few minutes. And then in more recent times, obviously, it started to look a little more iffy, too. And that's, for those of you who watch Game of Thrones, that's that bastard Jon Snow. I went about 10 years without watching, and then I actually kind of enjoyed it. Now, as I often preach, and I know you guys have seen the slide of nausea, so we'll get through as quickly as possible for those of you who know me. But just remember that all major tops or bottom will have a transitional pattern. In other words, an emerging trend pattern. And this could be a bow tie, a first thrust, or something along those lines. So if you go back in time and you go back to 2000, we had a major sell-off. Major sell-off means coming off of a major high, and this is a weekly chart. A major buy would be coming off of multi-year lows, such as decade lows or so. And again, a major sell, all-time highs or multi-year highs or multi-decade highs. And then a major buy, same sort of thing. I think the 2009 low was a 13-year low, if memory serves. And then we got a major buy off of that. Now, we did have a major sell back in 2015, 2016. And as you know, that really didn't turn into that big of a deal. Here's the problem, though. As Greg Morse often says, and as I quote him nearly weekly, all signals must be treated seriously, must be taken seriously. Or quoting him directly, we take all signals as if they will become the big one, Elizabeth implied. Now, it doesn't look like much, but the market had a pretty serious spill back in 2015, 2016. The buy and hold person was rewarded for doing the wrong thing and not getting out the way, as they have every other time they should have gotten out of the way. Now, I'm not saying rush out and sell the farm when you get these sell signals that we're going to look into in a few minutes. But you might want to have it appraised. And if you're holding something much longer term, you might think seriously about what you want to do with that holding. When, of course, you get these signals. And then we had a minor buy that followed that major sell. Now, minor buy means that it's a weekly buy, but it's not coming off of major, major, major lows. In this particular case, it was only two or three year lows in the market. And then the market rallied back up. Now, as I've said quite often, and let me just go through this real quickly, the Russell 2000 that had that sell signal back in 2015, even though the S&P didn't really get clipped too hard, the Russell lost 
roughly 18% from that bow tie. So it's very important that you pay attention to these cell signals when they occur. Now, it's kind of interesting, speaking of the Russell, let's go take a look at the recent Russell. And you'll notice recently that we had a bow tie. And by the way, I'm using Metastock for this. I use Metastock for most of my research, and I use Telechart for most of my analysis. I use Telechart because it's quick and dirty. I just bang on that space bar like the rat going for cocaine, going through a couple thousand charts every night. And that's how I do my research. My, I'm sorry, my analysis. My analysis is very empirical in nature. If you watch the market timing course, which I'll show you how to get to, the free one that is, you'll see that in one of the videos I talk about my empirical research, which gives me a good feel for what's going on in the markets. So getting back to the research, the research what I do in, that I'm doing in bow ties and all these other things, and I go back and look at the last 100 years of the market and determine if there's something there or not. Again, I'm using Metastock. And if you want these indicators, you will have to pay absolutely nothing for them because they're free in Metastock. When they asked me what I wanted to charge, I said, you know what? Let's not charge anything for them. Let's just give them out. I know. <laughs> give everything away and make it up in volume. <laughs> well, I would hope that if you did get Metastock, you would do it through a link that I provide you so I get credit for you purchasing it. Anyway. This ribbon turns bullish and stays bullish as long as the 10 simple is above the 20 simple and the 20 simple is above the 30 simple. I'm sorry, 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. So proper order means that the shorter term time periods are above the longer term time periods for uptrend. And downtrend proper order means that the shorter term time periods are below the longer term time period. So the 10 is below the 20 and the 20 is below the 30. Right here, the 10 is greater than the 20 and the 20 is greater than the 30. As I often preach, when these things begin to roll over and cross over a fairly short period of time, they look like a little bow tie. They look like that. And then if you put your little guy in here, he's wearing a little bow tie. Not too good of a drawer, as you can see. Anyway, if they're flipping back and forth or the process of rolling over, you're going to have a neutral. And as you can see, they were bullish for quite a while in here in the Russell. They turned bearish. And then we had the actual setup was right here. You can see the little arrow. That actually is programmed for you already. And then your entry is here. Now, keep in mind, as I preach, I don't suggest that you rush out and just run these specific scans in and of themselves. I would suggest that you first look at a lot of charts and then run some more specific scans. That way you're not missing something that could be on the cusp of triggering or something that might not be an exact perfect signal. S&P 500, very clean bow tie, meaning that they all came together quickly and crossed over. You could see that it went neutral for a short period of time doing the crossover. And then immediately went bearish. And this is on a daily chart now. This is not a weekly. This is a daily chart, as was that Russell I just showed. So the bow tie is, is the crossing is here. And then your actual setup would have been on this bar here. And then you could trade it like a pullback if it continues to pull back. Where the Russell 2000, let's go back to that real quick. Notice that right after the setup bar, it triggered the next day. So that's more of a textbook type of trigger on that bow tie. Now, as I said, every bear and every bull market is preceded by some sort of signal on a daily chart, on an hourly chart, and on a weekly chart. And as you just saw, that bow tie on a weekly chart can get you into a bull market and keep you into a bull market for a long, 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 long time. There's no guarantee that there won't be a whipsaw in 2015, 16. You could argue that was a bit of a whipsaw, although I think the S&P dropped about 8% from that signal. 8% is nothing to sneeze at 
in an index like the S&P. Sometimes an, that, an S&P index or an index like the S&P won't make 8% in an entire year. In fact, the S&P now I think is negative for the year. We'll take a look at that and we get to the live charts. The point I'm trying to make here in the bow ties is we need to pay attention to these weekly bow ties. Notice they're still bullish and they did turn neutral for a little while in here when they were beginning to zigzag back and forth over here back in May market got its act together but now you can see they're turning down and they could be on their way to cross over and set up on a weekly basis so pay attention to that it's not the end of the world nor can you see it from here but now might be a good time to pay attention if you don't come away with anything today from this then walk away with that. Now is the time to be prudent. Now is the time to pay attention. Now, I cannot give direct trading advice because I am no longer registered as anything. I'm just a guy who likes to trade and likes to teach trading. That's it. With that said, based on these potential longer-term signals in the works, you might want to reconsider anything you're doing longer term. I'm going to stop short of saying your 401k or whatever, but think about it. And that's all I'm saying. Now, once you start quoting Greg Morris, you can't stop. As I've said quite a bit, when Greg, when Greg visited a couple of years ago for Christmas, we got to talk about the markets as we normally do. And he said that whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. Now, think about it. When you And I've used this argument before, and he's used a very similar argument. Let's say you save up a million dollars for your retirement, and you hit a 2008, 2009 market loses half of its value. Well, you've lost half of your retirement. Now, obviously it came back, but it doesn't always come back. And that could be quite devastating to you. That's two different lifestyles, going from a million down to half a million over a fairly short period of time. So as Greg says, whipsaws are frustrating. And you know, like death and taxes, you can't avoid them. I'm gonna show you a whipsaw and this little silly little system that I came up with not too long ago that has caught every major bull and bear market over the last hundred years. But guess what? Occasionally it will have a whipsaw type of signals. But as Greg says, Whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You can survive frustration. And as I often say, the old hedge fund adage, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And again, another one of my little adages. <laughs> Better to be on the dock wishing you were out to sea than out to sea wishing you were on the dock. I've been caught in a low pressure system before. I've been caught in, in water spouts. I've been on a boat that nearly sank 400 miles offshore. I forget the exact distance, but we were halfway between Charleston and Bermuda. And it was funny. I'm like climbing the mast. Like that's going to help me. So we're in a couple of miles of water, you know, 10,000 feet of water, and I'm going to climb the mast. So I'll be 50 feet <laughs> I guess I'll be 50 feet off the bottom. Anywho, better to be on the dock wishing we were out to sea than out to sea wishing we were on the dock. So this little 10% system, just really simple, simple stuff that I came up with with one tiny little whipsaw filter. As I have preached before, would you start designing a system, make sure that if you do put a whipsaw filter in there, don't try to filter out every single whipsaw or what will happen is you'll end up with something that's very curve fit and likely will not work in the future. Now, also remember, my feeling on mechanical systems is don't trade a mechanical system in a pure, pure sense, but use it to kind of help guide you in your decision. So if this system begins to trigger a signal or actually triggers a real signal, then just think about where you are longer term with, and I hate to say 401k, I don't want to get into that type of financial planning or advising because legally I can't, but just kind of think about where things are. If I could educate you to make your own decisions, then 
you'll be much better off. And if you go back and look at every single signal that this system has triggered over the last hundred years, maybe you too will be convinced. But don't let me force your hand. You do your own due diligence. And anyway, the whipsaw filter that I have is just that, okay, well, if it's greater than or I think equal, and, and don't don't split it apart. I got to ask some questions on Dave. Is it greater than or greater than equal? Let's just say greater than or equal to 10% away. Then you want to get out of the way of the market. And then the whipsaw filter is that it must close below the 50-week moving average. So as long as you have two things, as long as you have Dave light, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average, and notice how we had a nice little trend here, you want to stay long provided that you're less than 10% away from 50-week highs. And notice that that stays bullish down there. And last week, if you go in and look at last week's week of charts, I actually published the code so you can see the exact code on that. And by the way, this is not built into the new meta stock. And I should say yet. Uh, they don't do big releases that often. But when they do a new release, I will give them this system. If you want in the meantime, let me know. And I'll just cut and paste it to you. But notice that once you're greater than 10%, and the close is less than the 50-week SMA. And this is why I said a whipsaw filter. I wanted to put a whipsaw filter in here to keep you from getting long or short too much. And so that's the whipsaw, whipsaw filter. Simply that not only do you have to be 10% away, you also have to close below that moving average. And that's just to try to help. Just in case this is a correction, which so far, at, at least at this particular time, it looked like it was. But once it got below that 50-week moving average, it started to look a little bit iffy. And as you can see, the market sold off from there. I don't remember. Oh, yeah, this is 1929. So the market went, in, went on to lose about 80 or 90% of its value from this signal. I think it's 80-something percent. Okay. Okay. Now, if we look at where we are now with this little system and hopefully you can see it on your screen but way down at the bottom oops way down at the bottom way down here if i can get there there it is you could see that it went neutral okay and it went neutral that it would bullish that it would neutral this is again this is could be a potential whipsaw in here okay and that's why we want to say it's got to close below the 50-week moving average, and it did at this particular point in time. But it also has to be 10% or more away from its all-time closing high. And in this particular case here, it went neutral because the price intersected the moving average, but it was not more than 10% or 10% or more, I should say, away from its all-time highs. So... We have a potential signal in the works here, a potential longer term signal. What I'm saying is longer term, the market might still be okay. Longer term, we might have just been in a correction. October or early October, when the volatility began to pick up a little bit, I told my peeps in the service, I said, look, guys, my gut is that the market could have a sell-off in October as it often does but it might just be the mother of all shakeouts. So longer term, this could just be the mother of all shakeouts, but I think now's the time to be prudent just in case it isn't. And it's looking pretty ugly. And we'll pick apart a few things when we get to the live charts. But notice that we're less than 10% away from all time highs, even with the recent slide we've had, but we are below that 50 week moving average. So. If we go more than 10% above and we remain below that 50-week moving average, then that would be a sell signal. Now, just FYI, the upside, that today's goal is not to teach you the entire system, and I'll show you how to get the system and videos on it in just one second. But this system buys whatever you have two days, I'm sorry, two weeks of daylight above, and you're less than 10% away from the 50-week high. So this thing was bullet was a long for a long long time even though it went neutral here you would still stay long in fact you would still actually be long this market based in this system 
Decline to worry about is 22% in a day, no chance to get out with an open-end fund. Well, the point I'm trying to make with this is, I don't know if you're talking about a flash crash or something like that. The point I'm trying to make with this is that I can't guarantee it'll always work, but I can tell you from my testing that it would have gotten you out before every major crash and every major bear market in history. So Howard's talking about the 87 crash. Well, Howard, if you go back in and look at my presentations that I did in prior weeks when I developed this system, you will see that I can't guarantee this will always happen, but the Friday before that Monday crash, you got an exit signal based on this system. And I can't guarantee that it will always happen, but so far it has. And if you take into consideration a lot of things that I talk about in here, which we'll talk about in just a minute, that a bear market top is usually a process. And even at 87, it was sort of a process. That market had made no forward progress for a long, long time. So, yeah, sooner or later you'll get whacked. We're, we're not all going to get out alive, right? But a lot of these things can keep you out of trouble. Now, a reoccurring theme that I talked about quite a bit, or been talking about quite a bit, is that you can't have a bear market without downside Dave light. So if you're taking a look at a longer term weekly chart going back to the mid 90s, the indicator that I have on top, again, this is free with Metastock, is green when the lows are greater than the 50 week moving average in red when it's below. So you can see that we did have a tiny, tiny bit of red. It was too small to draw in with a highlight, but we did have a little red then. But for the most part, we stayed green for a long, long time. And of course, the big blue arrow points higher. If you take a look at the bear market of 2000, there was zero green, meaning that the low of the price bar never got above the 50-week moving average on a weekly basis. Now, I did have one little kiss, and as I say quite often, this indicator measures the number of days of day of light. So when you intersect the moving average, it resets. So you can see that we had a whole bunch of day of light. We went like 70 weeks, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. Without that price bar touching that moving average, it went up and gave it a little kiss and then went another year or so without touching it again. So something as simple as this, and this is what amazes me. Now, keep in mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about grail hunting in a minute. And I've been there and done that and got the T-shirt. It's taken me years to go from that grail hunting, multiple indicators, analysis, paralysis, to come up with really simple things like this. And the reason, it, the reason that I come up with these simple things often is to provide a teachable moment on keeping it simple. Now, I always preach about the big blue arrow, but sometimes people need a little bit more than that big blue arrow to qualify or quantify the trend and whether or not they should be long or short a market. And one of the things, one of the simple things that came out of that type of reasoning was the IPO Dave Light system where we're just looking for a five period moving average. We're looking for a breakout away from that five period moving average. And then that goes all the way back, believe it or not, early in my grill hunting phase when I was keeping it simple, to 1995 or 1996, I think it was the, might have been January or December of the late 95 or early 96. I got the article on the office of my on the wall in my office on the other side. But anyway, I wrote a system called the 220 EMA breakout system, which was for currencies, and I still see that floating around the internet today, which is pretty cool. Anyway, the point is that you will have green on the upside and red on the downside and you can't have a bear market without downside dave light so when we turn red oops that might have been a Freudian slip if we turn red then we might have to begin to worry about 
entering a possible bear market phase. And again, if you go back to the run that we had over the past several years, 2011, you had a little bit of a whipsaw, if you want to call it that. And then you had one, two, three, four, or five years of upside. The aforementioned 2015, 2016 correction, I guess we'll call it that. And then, of course, the bull run that we've been in ever since. So the point I'm trying to make here, if we start getting some red, just because you get a little red, like here and here and to a lesser extent here, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but you probably want to be prudent on your individual positions, okay? Now, one of my gleamings in doing this is that when you approach about 100 weeks of upside Dave light, the market is due to correct. And we got pretty close here back in April, and what happened? Well, the market corrected. So this could still be part of that big correction going back to April, as we'll look at it in just one second. Bear market tops are off to the process. So maybe, just maybe, what we're seeing now is part of that process. And maybe this whole thing is just a big whipsaw. And this is where I keep coming back to putting things in perspective. As long as we don't have any downside Dave light, then maybe this is not the beginnings of a bear market. However, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. I'm okay with being whipsawed out of this market. I, and not that this always happens, we had one little long and it was at a profit that got stopped out in the model portfolio right before this slide started. And we also had one short, if you're using the little discretion, and I don't want to pour salt in anyone's wounds, but if you use a little discretion, there was one short that was still on from earlier, from way back in April, believe it or not, that paid off nicely. So keep an eye on where you are, bigger picture, longer term. Now, if we zoom in the chart, you could see that we did have a little kiss of the moving average. And when that happens, your Dave light, now this is not magnitude, this is just number of bars again. So you're up here close to 190 something. You go back to zero and then you start the whole process over. And guess what happened? We just kissed it recently. So now we start the whole process over of counting bars. Well, there's nothing to count now because the lows are not less than the moving average, meaning downside Dave light, and the highs are not greater than the moving average, meaning upside Dave light. Now, I know I'm repeating a lot of things that I've said lately, but I think as long as this market's in trouble, it bears repeating. Now, as I often say, this is something I didn't really realize or, or even think about, is that a market top is often a process and a market bottom is often an event. You go back to 2009 and the market just got sold out and just, it just was like, bleh. When you could cut the fear with a knife, usually you're getting close to the end. It doesn't mean you want to rush out and buy the markets because what does Big Dave say? Well, Big Dave says... It's always darkest right before it gets more dark. But it was pretty dark before it got really, really dark. And then S&P went down to 666, if you guys remember. But it did come flying off of those lows. I am not going to buy those lows. I see people out there that say, if an index ever loses half its value, rush out and buy a bunch of options. Well, that'll work until it don't. A famous value guy... I'm not going to say his name, but he sold a whole bunch of puts at that bottom, and he's seen as being a hero. Well, guess what? What if that market would have continued to slide, and he has a highly leveraged position, okay? Well, all those puts he sold would have been worth a lot more money. In other words, he would have lost his butt on that. So... It's kind of interesting, and this guy, they give him a pass on everything like he's a messiah just because he had a good track record and made a billion bucks. But <laughs> that'll work until it don't, but he might be long dead <laughs> before it, it stops working for him. Anyway, as you just saw, it's a bit of a process than an event. And last week, I just wanted to update the chart, but last week I noticed that my little drawing of lines through all the bars looks like an indicator called the zigzag. I don't use 
the zigzag, but I think if you were to use something like this, I think it's okay just because it helps to illustrate, not indicate, but illustrate what's already in the chart. So if you are going to use some indicators, play around with something really simple like the zigzag. And I think this just draws a new line once you have a 2% reversal. And you can change that 2% to whatever number you want. But you can see it looks a lot like the lines that I just draw, draw, drew through the chart. Easy for me to say. That's why I always come back to just draw lines through the price bars. What is the period of the MA? I'm using a 50-week moving average or a 50-period moving average on the weekly chart. And that's just a simple moving average, and that's just a little – just to keep the, simple, the system very, very simple. The bow ties are 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential, and I like the relationship – of those particular moving averages. It's just through years and years of messing around. I fell in love with the 20 exponential moving average for a long, long time. And then I would also find that other people like Linda Rasky like the 20 period exponential moving average. And then I ended up with a 30 because it was a little bit longer for the exponential. And then I also like the way just a plain old 10 bar simple works. In fact, anything less than 10 bars, whether it's weekly, daily, whatever you're looking at, five-minute bars, I like a simple moving average. And that's why the little IPO trading method I was talking about earlier, I'm using a five-period simple moving average, a couple of bars of daylight, new closing, high. That's pretty much the entire thing that I'm doing there, okay? Years of put selling to collect premiums, give it all back in one bad day. Yeah, that's something that I'm kind of noodling with right now. And I haven't I haven't fully fleshed it out and I don't want it to become too scientific. I just want to be it figure out a way to draw this. But if you if you make money in the market, you're going to feel like that. That's your emotions going up. If you lose money, you're going to feel like that. This is a minus 2 and this is a plus 1. And in trend following, you're going to be wrong more often than you're right. So net, net, you're going to end up in a negative emotional cycle, okay? However, if what I haven't factored in is the occasional outlier, how much is the occasional outlier if you make 100% on the occasional outlier, but you control your losses? So how, what's the emotional impact on that? So I think as a trend follower, this is probably what your emotions – look like long 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 term if you're trading a reversion to the mean system or something that has limited gains and unlimited losses your emotions probably look something like this and you're probably thinking like boy that's good that's a these are positive emotions well unfortunately you occasionally have that and can you survive this either you count mentally or monetarily that's that's tough to survive. The I think it was William Eckerd. I wish I knew the exact quote, but I have it in several of my slides. And basically he said, what feels good is not necessarily what works longer term. It's often disastrous longer term. So trend following is tough, and it's going to put its emotional toll on you. But if you can live through a few cycles and realize that, okay, I will go through drawdowns. I can live through them. It might take six to eight months to come out of a drawdown. I know that's hard. That's like eight months. You're closing in a one year of not making money. That's not an easy thing to do. And then you begin printing money again. So it's hard to wrap your head around that. Now let's talk about the death cross. <laughs> I couldn't find the slides that I used, so I actually went in and captured YouTube screens from some videos that I did a couple years ago. Ron Grice, he did some research on the Death Cross years ago, and he is the he's the CEO. Of, the reason I paused is somebody just typed in "sex is best" just before it ends. <laughs> okay, it was Steve that typed that. Okay, Steve. Well. Let me just warn you, Steve, if you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast, okay? Like trends. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Sex like like trans is 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 uh is best right before it ends. Okay, um, that's gonna be hard to recover from. Anyway, uh, Ron Grice, I think it's is um, I hope I'm saying his name his last name right. It's been several. I've only met him once, and it's been probably five six years. But he did a lot of work with the Death Cross. And he showed recovery times over so many months. And recovery times actually look pretty good. And his, that, not his entire research, but that piece of his research kind of said, hey, you know, maybe we don't have to worry about death cross too much. And Rob Hanna, I asked Rob about this. He's a friend of mine. And he's also in the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. So that's how I met all these guys. Actually, I knew Rob for, I knew Rob for a long time. But anyway, Ron Grice, I met through that. Anyway, long story endless, uh, I think Rob Hanna said that the death cross does have a slight edge longer term. But what I learned from it, what my take from it is the magnitude of the move from a death cross or any other cell signal is much more important than the mechanics of it. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. But before I do that, just notice that the 50 day moving average has begun to turn down and that's partially because of the drop-off effect so even if the market rallies a little bit that 50-week moving average could continue to head lower and as i said in the last couple of weeks when i was part of a hedge fund one of the things we looked at quite a bit was a 30 30 day simple moving average and part of my job was to look at the drop-offs to figure out where that average would be. Even though it didn't necessarily predict the, where the market would be or whatever, the, the guy who ran the hedge fund wanted to know what was going to happen with that 30 week, I'm sorry, 30 day moving average. So I began to pay a lot of attention to the drop off effect. And that's when you're taking prices at a lower level. I'm sorry, you're adding in prices at a lower level and you're dropping off prices at a higher level. Now, What's kind of interesting is you are, if you're looking at this thing, just to kind of know how the moving averages act. So you're probably thinking, well, what difference does it make how they act? Well, the 50-day and the 200-day are well-watched moving averages, so it kind of helps to know how they're going to act. Not that you want to factor this in directly to your analysis, just kind of know what's going on. So you can see that the slope is turned down pretty hard in here, but if the market stays about where it is, you'll actually be adding in some higher prices for a while. And that could help to flatten out that moving average. But right now, as you can see, it looks like it's on its way to make that death cross. Bow ties are much better than death cross. Absolutely, yeah. A death cross is a very, very, very slow signal. But it's something that everybody gets all excited about. And I just want to make sure you're educated on the death cross, okay? Now... I would encourage you, if you want to learn more about the bow ties and my empirical research and my TFM 10% system, because the market is in trouble now, I thought it would be nice of me to, to give away the a piece, at least, of the market timing course. So I put together a mini market timing course, and uh, I stopped short to call it a crash course. If you are watching a recording of this, just look at my website for this banner ad, and usually it'll be at the top. If you're already a gold member or a free member, or even a free member of my website, you already have this course underneath the free stuff area. Now, if you're if this banner ad is not on my website when you're watching this, just go into members and sign up or click on this new to trading and you can go in and get that free course. Now it's interesting. I didn't get my, I thought I had the slides in here, but evidently, let me just double check to see if they went in. Uh, what I wanted to show you with that death cross is that, no, they didn't make it in. Okay. Just take my word for it. I'll go in and watch that presentation from 2050. But the point I was making with the death cross is that the magnitude of the drop is much more concerning than the drop in and of itself. I'm sorry, the signal in and of itself. So let me see if I could flesh that out for you a little bit. 
with a live chart. So what I did was a couple of years ago, and I updated this morning. I'm sorry I didn't get into slides. I guess I was just running late. I thought I had it, but it didn't go in. If you go in and look at these death crosses historically, and I'm just picking some random periods. Well, let's go back and look at 2000, I guess, would be a good period to look at. If you're trading something like this on a purely mechanical basis, then your death cross would be you would sell way up here, okay? And then if you, you would actually buy in down here. Well, that looks pretty good. But let's go to like a 2009. Maybe that's what I wanted to look at. Let's see. Yeah, a little bit better type of uh, thing here. You can see that that signal would have gotten you back in a little bit later. And what's most important is the magnitude of the drop. So let me see if I could draw that in. I don't know what happened to my slides. My apologies. We'll cover it next week. Let's get a slide up. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. So what I'm trying to say is if you get a death cross, I guess I should say it like the media says, it, death cross, okay, and the market's up here. So that's your signal. Well, the market might do this, and then the market might do this, okay, and then you get a new signal up here. You get a buy signal. Well, people get caught up and say, okay, here's your sell. And then here's your stop and reverse, however you want to look at it. So this signal here, you would actually lost, let's say, 1% trading that signal. What they fail to realize is that, well, this move here might be 30 or 40% lower. So it's the magnitude of what happens after the signal, not what happens waiting for that next signal to come along. So... In some cases, the market might sell off really, really hard, but then come back. So that's the whole point I'm trying to make there. It's, it don't try to use something like, especially a death cross and a golden cross. A golden cross, I mean, the, it crosses back up. The 50 crosses back above the 200. Don't try to use that mechanically. But if you do get one of those signals, just realize the magnitude of what happens next could be very important, like any other signal. Any studies on recovery times versus rate of plunge? No, I, I wouldn't get too far into that. You know, what's the old adage? They Stocks take the escalator up and the elevator down. They slide faster than they glide. I know you pilots are like, Dave. A glide goes lower. Well, just work with me, okay? Glide meaning slowly ascending. I don't think that there's anything there that you could actually use in your trading other than it's one of those observation type of things that you might want to pay attention to. A few weeks, I'm trying to think when I did this. I know it's in the market timing course, but I did talk about, especially when we're looking at that green light, red light, Dave light, okay? One light, two light, red light, green light. <laughs> so like Dr. Seuss. But one thing I was pointing out is that it stays green a lot more than it stays red. And the point I was making in the market timing course is that that's a rather poor argument for market timing because it's the magnitude that'll kill you. So if you lose 50% of your money over a short period of time, you're not going to be very happy about that. Thanks to the first book, I do have a hard copy. Excellent. Yeah, what I did was, because I talked about sharding in the appendix of Dave Landry on swing trading, which I think I wrote in 2000, <laughs> 18 years old. Wow. If you look at the cover, you'll see a young punk version of me on there. And then I also talked in one of the chapters, I talked about options as a substitution for stock. So what I originally originally did was, easy for me to say, I put Dave Landry on Swing Trading as a free bonus. If you stayed a member for more than a week, you got the Dave Landry on Swing Trading. But what I decided to do, given the nature of the market, so everybody can get in front of it, was in addition to publishing this market timing course, make it free, at least the majority of it, I added in Dave Landry on swing trading. So that's what I believe it's Howard is talking about, a free copy of that. Okay, Howard didn't think of that. Yeah, well, 
what he's referring to is uh, what he didn't think about was that that sometimes you get a major sell signal right before something bad really happens. Now, I can't guarantee you that the 10% TFM system or bow ties or whatever will get you out the way before everything really bad happens. But quite often, especially if you look at the fact that many tops are a process, quite often it will get you out of trouble because, because why? Well, it's often darkest right before it gets more dark. So as things start getting ugly and these systems, whatever you want to call them, begin triggering signals, then it could be waking you up to the fact that the market's in trouble, something's going wrong. It feels right to be lost in the right direction of the trend. So Death Cross might be a good entry point shortly thereafter, depending. Well, I don't know if I would trade a Death Cross in and of itself, but I would certainly pay attention to a Death Cross, not because it tests out, because it really doesn't test out very well. However, the magnitude of the move, that's my whole point today, and I, I, I don't have my slides for it, but I'll, I'll bring them next week. My whole point is that it can get pretty ugly after that or any other sell signal for that matter, okay? Bow tie is much better than death cross. Yes, thank you. I think they are because the exponential moving average is going to catch up to price quicker than a simple moving average. You're going to eliminate some of those lag, some of that lag. But, of course, you know, trading is always a trade-off. You might actually introduce a little bit more whipsaw. But for the most part, yes, I prefer something like bow ties and something as simple, the TFM 10% system, because that's pretty much price-based. And you do have a moving average in there, but it's the move of the price through the moving average and not sitting around waiting for that moving average to move, okay? Hopefully that made sense. I asked because you said that the performance after the signal is better than you might think. My... My point is that often the magnitude is what you have to worry about. Okay, I hope I made that clear. So with that signal or any other signal for that matter, you know, let's say you're, let's say you're, let's, let's pick up my own stuff. Okay, let's say you're trading bow ties. Okay, you get a bow tie down. So, okay, I'm going to short this market. I'm going to stay short until I get a bow tie up. Well, you might get a bow tie up way over here. Okay. Well, net, net, you scratch out. Well, screw these bow ties. Well, it's the magnitude you got to watch. So if you get a death cross and the market drops 50%, okay, and then, you know, by the time it comes back up, it's nearly a scratch. Well, this signal is not a scratch signal. This signal is a 50% drop, and that's important, okay? To get a death cross, you're more than likely below the 50-week moving average for a while. Already, yeah, you know, I would I would not rush out to trade the death cross, but what I would do is I would look at where you are with that ten percent indicator, if you want to call it an indicator. It's not an indicator, but if you're ten percent or more away from fifty-two week highs on a closing basis, and you're closing below the fifty-week moving average, you might want to seriously think about getting out of the way. Longevity in trading doesn't happen in without. Money management. That's correct. So what you would do, and thank you for bringing that up, is let's say you had a signal. It could be any kind of signal. It doesn't even have to be my stuff. But let's say you do have a signal to go short. Let's say you get a signal up here to go short. Well, two things I'd recommend you do. One, take partial profits. And then two, trail a stop lower. Okay. And it's kind of interesting. I was looking at one of my old presentations and getting ready for today. And I talked about how over time, my trailing stop will begin to look like a long-term moving average. Okay. It's not a longer term moving average, but it will sort of look like that. So you can see, I've just kind of winging in here, throwing in a moving uh, trailing stop. So the point is that you're going to try to hold on as long as you can. And then eventually you're going to get stopped out. Okay. But you're not going to sit around and wait for some kind of major signal way up here. And obviously, the same thing goes to the long side. Okay, a couple of random thoughts on the market. Pretty much the same thing I've been saying for weeks. And then I do want to touch upon a little bit of psychology real quick. Don't panic. Be prudent. 
If you have any leftover longs, I have one leftover long. I do have one at Fat Fingered, admittedly. But I do have a stop in both of those, okay? And the left, the one I fat fingered, actually, I entered in the middle of this mess while we actually headed lower because I like the setup and I put in the wrong order. Somehow I got a market execution instead of a stop, but that's another story in and of itself. Maybe a trading lesson down the road. But as far as longs, I have one leftover long in my portfolio that has somehow survived this slide that we've been through. Sometimes these more speculative type of stocks, IPOs and things like that, can trade or, or can trade higher or certainly not get, you might not get stopped out. It could certainly happen. I mean, obviously, you know, what happens, happens. But sometimes these stocks can withstand a market that is failing or a market that's in trouble simply because the speculative stocks don't always get thrown out. Super speculative stocks don't always get thrown out. The momentum stocks often get thrown out first, okay? I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but the super speculative stocks sometimes get held on to and sometimes could actually be people feel like, well, I'm not going to put a stock, put my money in a stock that has actual fundamentals, but I might just piss away a little money on a little IPO or something, okay? So don't panic. Make sure you have some stops. And then this is something I've kind of been skirting lately, and I can't decide how far into this I want to get. But I've got enough stuff to keep me busy for a while. But maybe longer term, I might be willing to talk about this a little bit more. In fact, I guess I've already have. If you're following weekly bow ties, if you're following the TFM 10% 10, 10 system, then you know where we are in the longer term cycle and you know whether you should be mostly long or mostly short. Now, what is is don't worry about the why. I think last week or week before, and this is from a gentleman named Rolf, R-O-L-F. The book is The Art of Thinking Clearly. If you go to my website, davelater.com slash books dash two dash read, you can get a link there. I think I'll make 35 cents if you click on it, so please click on it. <laughs> Uh, or buy the book and I'll make 35 cents. But anyway, not the greatest behavioral science book I ever read, but it's pretty good in that he gives a lot of little short stories to get his point across. And one thing is that we're connection machines. And as I think I said last week or week before, we're selling our house. And when people come to see the house and they find that they come off, it's like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> I got all this soundproofing and I got the mics and I got the studio and I used to have currencies all over the wall. I'm taking them down, getting ready for the move, painting the walls and stuff. And when they find out I deal with stocks and I trade, they start asking me, well, why is the market? Go is it the interest rates that's making the market go down? It's like, well, I don't know. It's just going down. And they're probably thinking, this guy's probably not too good at what he does if he doesn't know why. Well, you don't need to know why because what is, is all you need to know is which way the price is headed. Rocketry, you remember that? Yeah. I'm no, I haven't done that in a while. That's a blast from the past. Rockets the size of ICBMs in my attic. I need to get rid of them before I move. Anybody wants them, let me know. It'd be good to put outside of a store or something. Be a tension getter. I thought about putting a big one on a, on a wagon and dressing as Kim Young un and pulling it around for Halloween. <laughs> if you are a trader type, which you are because you're here, obviously, you're not going to get rich on the short side, but you might consider shorting to pick up a few bucks here and there. And one way to do that would be using deep in the money puts as opposed to outright shorting. Uh, to my surprise, somebody with a major broker emailed me and said they couldn't get shares of short where I was showing 10 million shares, at least in one of the brokerages, they couldn't get any. And they actually have accounts with both of those brokerages. Anyway, long story endless, there are some things that you don't have to worry about if you're using deep in the money puts, but there's no free lunch. There's some other things you have to worry about. So. And that gets a little, that gets muddy fast. A lot of moving parts with the options. As I've been preaching, even if you get knocked out longer term, so what? You could survive frustration. The people who got knocked out in 2015, 16, like me, look pretty stupid when the market went straight back up. But guess what? If this thing does not come back, then all of a sudden I might not look so stupid. As Greg Moore says, no benchmark exists for the trend follower who uses cash as an asset class. Okay, when I woke up this morning, I thought, okay, what am I gonna talk about in this show? It's like every week I think, well, I'm gonna start working on my weekend charts on Monday. 
So when Thursday comes around, I'm not scrambling to get get it up and running and get the notices out and everything like you see me do, especially this year. And it's like, well, I'm just going to talk mostly about market conditions. Like I can put that together pretty quick. And I think it's important that I talked about market conditions as I just did for the last however many minutes I've been talking. But then I got to thinking, it's been a while since I talked about psychology and through the putting together this learning management system over the last year, I've come to realize there are two types of aspiring traders. Those that think they want to be successful and those who truly want to be successful. Those who think that they want to be successful or willing to blow their hard-earned cash in the markets but not on themselves. If you watch the intro videos, which you can get free under the learning management system, just go to free stuff or sign up and then go to free stuff. And that's right next to the market timing course. As I said in, in those videos, I'm amazed that people are willing to put their hard earned cash into the markets and not learn how to trade. In one particular example, it's it's actually this one guy's gonna think I'm picking on him, but I've actually seen it happen quite often. And that's why I said those who are willing to put their hard earned cash in the market but not invest in themselves, they go out and they try something, lose all their money. Email me, Dave lost all my money. I'll be back though. And then they ask me a bunch of questions and finally I'm like, look, go back and reread the first book. And they're like, well, I'm gonna, I never got around to buying that. You know, it's like, well, you're willing to waste all your money in the market, thousands and thousands of dollars. Not that my methodology is be all end all, but you're not willing to invest in yourself. Now, obviously, those who truly want to be successful are willing to invest in themselves. Now, it's not my way or the highway. I'm talking about in general. Find something conceptually correct that makes sense that's not BS. And by not BS, I'll give you a case in point. Recently, just because it, it aggravates me when I see all these ads, I clicked on an ad for a webinar, started watching the webinar. And after 30 minutes of the guy talking about how great he is and he's going to tell you his system, and for 30 minutes he did nothing to teach markets he finally starts teaching the system, and I'm like, okay, well, maybe this guy has something. And then he shows this big trade, which had nothing to do with the system, and he even admitted it had nothing to do with the system. So he's out there winging it, and every now and then he hits it right, hits it good, posts his P&L or whatever, looks like a genius, and he's sucking you in to that. So I'm not talking about some sort of guru chasing, but find somebody out there that makes sense, that's talking trends, and it doesn't have to be me, but I, I guarantee you, if they are talking trends and they are talking reality, they're going to sound a lot like me. Now, the those that think they want to become successful as a trader are in a constant state of grail hunting. They don't stick with something long enough. They're out chasing rainbows, always looking for the next big thing. Those who truly want to become successful eventually will sell upon something that fits their psyche and their lifestyle. They might have to go through some trial and error, but they'll learn through the process. They'll learn that you can't be a successful doctor and a successful day trader, especially if you're a busy doctor, and you can't carry a laptop from exam room to exam room, watch your positions and treat your patients at the same time. They also learn that it has to be something that makes sense to them. They learn that, oh, okay, well, let me just trade in the direction of the trend because after all, the only way you could ever make money is to capture a trend. This trend following makes a lot of sense. The people who think that they want to be successful keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. They're system hopping. They're fighting trends. They're not on our next stops and so on and so forth. Well, Einstein once said the definition of insanity 
is doing the same thing over and over and somehow expecting a different outcome. The trader who truly does want to become successful is willing to learn from their mistakes. Now, I'm going to tell you where I'm going with all this in one second, but let's get through this quickly. The trader who thinks that they want to become successful is constantly joining the church of what's happening now. Now, occasionally, they do hit upon something that gives them false hope. They print money for a little while, and then they usually blow up shortly thereafter. But they think they've stumbled across that holy grail. Now, in kind of a weird dichotomy or ironic dichotomy of this whole thing is that those who truly want to become successful can become a little distraught. Whereas the guy who is who thinks he wants to be successful, he gets a little overly, overly excited when he happens to hit it right by attending the church of what's happening now. The thing about those who truly want to become successful, they become a little distraught, but usually that's right before a major breakthrough. And one thing that I've learned is they're often a lot closer to success than they think they are, whereas those who think they want to become successful out there system hopping and chasing systems and chasing gurus, they're a little delusional. They think that they know, but they don't. Whereas the prudent person who truly does want to become successful often is a lot closer than they think. Now, what happens is they're often missing key pieces but they don't know that they don't know. And here's where I've been coming in and the reason I've been working morning, noon, and night trying to get this learning management system launched this year is because for those who really want to learn, truly want to learn, I want to make sure that they have the tools that they need. And what's Tough for me after seeing people come really, really close but not quite get there is that the missing piece might be some little small piece. And I've helped these people in a lot of cases find that missing piece, but in a lot of cases discover that, well, wait a minute, I thought they knew all these things because they're smart, but there's some pieces that are missing. The person who thinks that they want to be successful will occasionally get sucked in by quick rich a get rich guru now like i said they're not willing to invest in themselves but every now and then they're willing to throw money at a guru a couple days ago i got an email somebody said they just made a hundred thousand dollars over whatever short period of time and they're implying that you can too well i'd be willing to bet good money that they cannot repeat that performance you know you see these guys out there i just made ten thousand dollars i haven't even had my breakfast yet well, they're not making $10,000 every day. They might have made $10,000 on it one day when they filmed that little video, but they're not consistent longer term. And by consistent, I don't mean making money every day. What did I just say a few minutes ago? You might go six to eight months if you're trend following and barely keep your head above the water. But these guys are out there, these scumbags suggesting these ridiculous returns. And if you go in and watch Trading Full Circle and some of the videos in the learning management system, you'll see where if these people were doing what they say they're doing or can do, and so could you, then it would come to somewhere up to upwards of $180 million a year. Well, if I could make $180 million a year, as much as I enjoy doing what I'm doing now, as much as I enjoy teaching, I'm not sure you'd see my fat ass again. You know, I might just sit on a boat and make a few trades and sail off into the sunset. Now, the person who who thinks they want to be successful continues to just throw stuff against the wall, hoping that something will stick. Where is the person who truly wants to be successful will eventually get it, and they will realize that there is no holy grail. To keep it simple, use something silly like bow ties or for the overall market, keep an eye on like that TFM 10% system 
or use something like Dave Light and IPOs, or just moving average, a pullback to a moving average, or just draw your big blue arrows and use something like a TKO with persistency, something simple. Now, moving on to the positive, those who eventually become enlightened, again, realize there's no holy grail, and gurus will come and go. I would encourage you to make a list of the current list of gurus when you log in, and they're probably advertising on my own YouTube channel because I noticed that last night, if I was looking for some of my stuff, if you Google my stuff, a lot of these gurus will come up. So they're, they're looking in their targeted search. They're looking, okay, well, these people are using these methodologies or whatever. So let's advertise to them. But one thing I was thinking right as I'm going live this morning is make a list of these gurus. And five years from now, let's see if they're still around. Now, those who do become enlightened, they learn that they will never get it exactly right and embrace the imperfection. Even though I've been at this a long, long time, I still have trouble with wrapping my head around that, okay? Like I said a few weeks ago when I was talking about being cognizant, it's like, hey, I got out of a market. The market begins to drop. Boy, I felt pretty smart about getting out. This was at half profits. And then the market continued to erode, and I got to thinking, well, wait a minute. If I'd have gotten out of everything, I wouldn't be losing. And then the market turned around and went back up. Obviously, that day I was watching the screen more than I should have, admittedly. But you'll never get it exactly right, especially in trend following. You have to learn to accept and embrace that imperfection. And the more successful you are in life, the harder accepting that imperfection will be. And that's fodder for a lot of my trading psychology presentations. One of the epiphanies for one of my clients when when he finally began when he finally began to click with him is when I explained to him that trading done properly can often be boring. There are some exciting things that that I'll do every now and then that will happen, maybe a little day trade, open a gap reversal, and you kind of mentally monetize what that profit would be if you could do that every day. But most of the time, trading, once you get it, is actually quite boring. And I, as I often preach, I keep myself extremely busy so I don't get sucked into unnecessary day trades or trading markets that I shouldn't or trying to make something happen. I stay so busy where whenever I do trade now, I find myself, if I, if I find myself, or should say when, truth be told, I mean, I watch the screen a little too much sometimes, but when I find myself stuck to that screen for whatever reason, I'm thinking, you know, I have a deadline to get my slides together for this presentation, or I really want to roll out this learning management system. I don't want to let it go. It's almost been a year, and then if you go back and look at when it actually started, several years. I don't want it to be another year before it rolls out. So my current activity of watching that screen and being tempted to micromanage and fire off a day trade, that is moving me away from my longer-term trading goals, and it's also moved me away from my business goals. So I need to get away from that screen, and I just remind myself that trading done properly can often be boring. As I often quote, the real enlightenment comes when you learn the difference between intuition and intuition, and that's pretty hard. And if you, if you, it's got me thinking kind of a little bit about the outcome bias and Annie Duke's book, Thinking in Bets, which is a really good read. I wish you would have had a little bit more of a, some sort of, what word am I looking for? Or created a little bit more of epiphany in, with me. I mean, the bottom line is the secret is separating luck from skill and recognizing the difference of those two. And when you truly do have that setup, that great looking setup, whether it's an individual stock or some sort of opening gap reverse or something that you're playing, then it becomes second nature and you know that it's skill. And if it doesn't work out, well, it happens. 
But that's the the secret is learning to separate the luck from the skill, learning to separate the trying to make something happen to where you actually have an opportunity. Now, without going into a long rant, too late, I know. If you do that post-mortem after every trade, then if you're honest, you can go back and say, well, this was a trade that I should have taken. It didn't work out. Okay. So I did the right thing. It just didn't work out. We tend to, and I'm trying to think of the guy's name, Terrence Odeen, I think it is. He said that we tend to attribute our success to our skills and our failures to bad luck. Now, both of those things play a role in both of those things. But separating the two is key, as Miss Duke has pointed out. One thing which is kind of interesting is right, right as I'm going live with this presentation today, I'm thinking how after 20-something years, I'm kind of just scratching the surface on some of this psychology and now neurology and physiology of what's actually happening happening in the markets and why I do feel kind of odd and strange about things and why I'm tempted to make these emotionally charged decisions. And before I understood why, I reached a point where I had to just force myself to do the right thing, to honor the stop, to take the entry when I saw it and not second guess it, to not deal in the mediocre stocks and so on and so forth. But the longer I'm in this business, the more I understand why these unnatural feelings or natural as a trader. These are natural feelings or natural as a trader because trader trading goes against life in general. It goes against our psychological makeup. It goes against our physiological makeup going all the way back to the caveman days. Recently, I, I proofed Linda Rasky's book and it was very refreshing to read about a real trader who had a lot of ups and downs and did not have the holy grail when it comes to the markets, but was also extremely successful. So the Ys, W-H-Y-S, will come later. And I'll just give you a case in point. The gentleman I was talking about earlier where I said, hey, once you figure this out, this trading thing out, you're going to find that trading done properly is boring. The other thing that I told him, I was like, look, the reason you're feeling so bad about this particular loss, and this goes back to the late, great Mark Douglas, this is where I got this line of reasoning, is because that one particular thing in and of itself, that one particular loss in and of itself is not necessarily that big of a deal, especially if you followed your plan, of course. But what's happening is you're dealing with the ghost of losses past. It and sometimes, as Douglas says, it could be like every other loss you ever had, those feelings come over you. I've often told the story where I might snap at one of my children. From an outsider, I might look like a maniac, but that one thing that I snap on is not necessarily the one thing that child did, but the combination of every other time I asked them not to do that one particular thing or do that one particular thing, whatever the case may be, that created all this Frustration. Now, I'll give you an example. As I think I've said before, my daughter, who wanted this dog, which we dearly love, by the way, the daughter, the dog, not the daughter. <laughs> I'm half kidding. No, 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 we love them both. Anyway, she wanted this dog, even cried when there was a chance she might not get it because it was kind of on the fence. With you know, the, the, My wife wanted it too, so it made it a little bit more difficult. Anyway, long story endless, she, we have to beg her to give the dog water and it was like a Thursday night and we begged her to give the dog water and my wife says look if you don't give the dog water because we've been riding your butt on give the dog water if you don't give the dog water tonight when I wake up this dog bowl is dry then we are going to cancel your trip now they had a little bit of water in the bowl so the dog didn't go <laughs> didn't whatever dehydrate overnight it was one of these big bowls like with five gallons you got to fill up so the next day, my wife wakes up and no water was in the bowl. So she canceled my daughter's trip. To the outsider, the crime doesn't fit the punishment, but it's everything that's happened prior to that. 
So believe it or not, this, the, I do have a point. It's like that loss that's really stressing you out is not that loss in and of itself, and you don't know why you feel so bad about it. Well, just deal with it, and then later down the road, you will understand these psychological problems, these psychological urges, and some things are on a physiological level. Now, things on a physiological level, once you understand that it's brain chemistry or whatever you want to call it, or neurology that's causing these things, then it's like, well, you have to accept it or don't. And if you don't accept it, then you, you need to find something to do other than trading. Now, the big thought in this whole process about those who want to be successful and those don't is that I know that some people quit right before they're almost there. People who really do want to work at it and really do become successful. And that's why I put together this learning management system. And if someone contacts me and, and is making mistakes and we go in and see that they're stressed out in their trading, well, why are they stressed out in their trading? They're losing money on their trades. We go in and see that they haven't finished the psychology course or they haven't finished the money management course, then maybe that's what's lacking. And we've identified something that could physically be done. Now, if all that is done and there's still problems, then we can go on to fix that through a new session or through adding things in. And I truly believe 95% of what you need is here. The other 5%, in addition to you, okay, is would be handled through the question and answer session. So I really think I'm on to something here. I know I'm a nerd, but check it out if you get a chance. And I do think if you really want to be successful, then it's all there. Steve said, I really enjoy Layman's Guide. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Steve. Glad you enjoyed it. All right. Believe it or not, this is a chart show. <laughs> I think I've pontificated way too much. Boy, Chief Orman, he really wound up today. All right, let's take a look at the market, the live market. I came in today all excited, hoping that we get an opening gap reversal so I could play it. And so far, that hasn't happened. The market really didn't open up that big. Futures were huge pre-market, but we must have had a little rally right before the open. So, so far, I mean, we've got a little gap here, but keep your eye on what's going on, bigger picture. And I still think we're in trouble. If you don't know or didn't know anything about the markets, just take a net net measurement or draw a line, okay, and see where we are. Yeah, you guys want to ask about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. And you can see with this little bit of a rally, we're still down 7% from the September highs. So market still looks like it could be in trouble in here. And once we get this one thing I want to show you real quick, but let me let me get to the rest of the market. Start yeah, keep asking about individual stocks. Boy, I, I went way longer than I thought I would. <laughs> uh, real quick, NASDAQ composite, obviously pretty serious slide there. So far, we're just in a little bit of pullback mode. And then Russell 2000, if I could find it. As you know, recent bow tie there. Back here would have been your sell. And so far, just kind of pulling back a little bit. Now, the media is going to get all excited about a little bit of a rally. And you're probably thinking, Dave, when will, we, when will you turn bullish again? Not that I'm bearish. I'm very cautious, I would say. I'd be care you got to be careful not to label yourself. But for me to get excited about this market, where we are today, it would have to go on to make new highs. Now, the other thing that is in the back of my head when I'm thinking about quite a bit, and you know, you guys are trader types, so I'm not too worried about you guys. But what has me pretty amazed is that the buy and hold people are pushing buy and hold, even though the market has begun to slide. And I saw something recently, and I'm not going to throw the company under the bus, but they were like, you know, this is just sector rotation. And I'm like, okay, what sectors are they rotating out of? This one? They're, they're rotating out of crappy sectors to more crappy sectors or less crappy sectors. What are they rotating into? So as you flip through these sectors, downtrend, 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 downtrend. 
where is the sector rotation? Okay, so the argument is, well, there's always a bull market somewhere. Well, where is that bull market? How can you use sector rotation as an argument to hold the course? I mean, look at these sectors. Look at how ugly. That's all over the place. But 90% of these sectors are headed lower. And then the other half are just chopping around, right? <laughs> or slightly lower. So, I mean, other than utilities, which is just kind of hanging in there, how can you say this is sector rotation? So believe in what you see and not in what you believe or not in what you hope. All right. Okay. Let's get to some stock picks. LTHM. Um, this is not jumping out at me. But if it does close at a new high, let's put a, a five period moving average in here and see where we are. Let's do this. Let's just redo this. So let's put a five period. Yeah, keep the picks coming. Sorry I ran so long. What Chief Orman really wound up, huh? <laughs> So, yeah, if we get two lows with this greater than the moving average, you'd have one here and then a close above 17, then, yeah, this might be worth taking. But until that happens, don't do it. S&P opened strong. Ogre, after one half hour, made a low today. Could have sucked you in and then went straight up to new highs. Well, you know, I came in saying I'm really going to play this Ogre, and I'm really excited about this Ogre. And based on where the futures were, I thought we were going to open up like right here, okay, and then begin to tank, at least above yesterday's high. I was surprised to see that we opened up not that much higher than yesterday's close. Now, I was still willing to play an opening gap reversal, but I was more likely to sit on my hands and say, well, unless we take out 270, I am not going to play that opening gap reversal. In fact, it's not an opening gap reversal. It's an opening lap reversal. Now, I did play – now, I, I hate to admit it, but I did play this reversal late in the day yesterday just because I thought it was worth playing. I don't know if it will be worth playing today, but if we did – if we were to come in today and it gapped higher, then I would have played that opening gap reversal as I think I mentioned in my now column, I did play this opening gap reversal, although it took a long time for it to reverse. But here you are gapping down to brand new multi-month lows, okay? The market's very oversold, and this is just an S&G type of day trade. It's not something that I want to do as my, or I wouldn't mind doing as my bread and butter, but it doesn't happen every day. So you can't go in every day and do this. You have to pick your spots very carefully is the point I'm trying to make. So today's open, I was like, wait a minute, Dave, that's not that great of a gap. I thought something was wrong with my charts at first. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, this is not as big, as big of an opportunity as I think it might be. Whereas yesterday we had this big old fat gap open from there to there. That's pretty impressive. It shot up and then came back in. Okay, does that make sense? So, yeah, you could have got sucked in, but that's where you got to be careful not to be too close to the market. And say, well, wait a minute, bigger picture, this is not a huge gap way up here. Whereas down here, this was a pretty big gap. I mean, that's, what's that, two, that's five points. That's a pretty big gap lower. And the spiders. Okay, any more stock picks? I know I'm running late, but I'd squeeze in a couple more. All right, while we're in impasse, obviously I want to thank all you guys for coming. Okay, L, sell short ALGT, ALGT. There's not a whole lot of shorts that are set up just now, but they will be if we continue to bounce. Okay, here's a stock that looks like it's in trouble. Here's a stock with a big blue arrow pointing lower. A couple of problems. One, it's wide and loose and all over the place. Two, at this juncture, I would rather be shorting stocks like we're short GoDaddy, for instance, okay, out of this bow tie. I would much rather short stocks that are still way up here and priced for perfection and everybody could run for the door at the same time. Remember, everything we do has a psychological 
backing to it, okay, or is back with psychology. If you're shorting stocks that are already in long, long, long-term downtrends, given the fact that we're way up here, I'm, I'm using my hands, you can't see me, I forget, but given the fact that the market is still fairly high longer term, if the market begins to turn around, sometimes those low price stocks actually do get bought up. There is some sector rotation bottom fishing into them. So at this point in time, I would much rather be in a stock coming off of major highs like a GoDaddy or an INTU or an NTAP, something like this, as opposed to something in a longer term downtrend. Now, we are short this end tap, but you can see it still looks like it's in a lot of trouble, even though it's had a retrace rally. Well, what do I preach? Shorts suck. They often bounce back. They often have retrace rallies. All right, last one. Um, this is kind of interesting. It's a little late to buy it now. It's also pretty thin. Let's take a look at the um, volume on this. Well, it has a little volume here and there, but for the most part, it's pretty thin. So I'd be careful of that. I don't have enough time to do a, a did that volume analysis on it. Uh, the range was not that tight. I'm sorry, the range was a little tight to go after it. So, yeah, maybe on a pullback, but you're going to need a little bit more volume on that. But, yeah, good eye on that. Be careful with the volume. You're going to need a little bit more pullback. All right, so it's going to have to pull back for me to get long, something like this. So here's a case where I would wait for a secondary signal as opposed to more of a pioneer type of signal. Okay. All right, well, let me go ahead and shut things down because it gets a little hard to manage the recordings after about an hour and a half. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, sorry for all the glitches lately. I promise to work through those and get better at that. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.